Hello, and welcome to the Yale Centre for British Arts at Home series. I'm Rachel Stratton, postdoctoral research associate at the museum, and I'm delighted to welcome artist Carla Black to our program today. Please note that this conversation is connected to a larger symposium, Works on the Floor, which took place earlier today. This event was recorded and it will be made available on the Yale Centre for British Arts website uh, at a later date. Um, because of this, it's possible that members of the audience may reference content, questions and or comments that were raised during the course of the symposium. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, please note that this program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We'll be using the Q&A feature located in your navigation bar to gather your questions for Carla and they'll be answered at the end of the program. But please feel free to submit questions at any time throughout our conversation. If you would like closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking the icon on your nav navigation bar. I'll now read the Yale University land acknowledgement. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skyadakoke, Golden Hill Pugasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquian speaking people have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. Honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. Born in Scotland in 1972, Carla Black creates her abstract and immersive sculptures through experimentation with unconventional materials such as cellophane, makeup, plaster, sugar paper, and wool. Her works are often spread on the floor or suspended from the ceiling to create entire environments. The interplay of delicate abstract forms, pastel colors, and surprising materials demands a physical experience and encourages a new way of seeing and perceiving. Black has had solo exhibitions across the UK, Europe, and the US. She represented Scotland at the 57th Venice Biennale in 2011, and in the same year was nominated for the Turner Prize. Her work was also shown at Manifesta 10 in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2014. So Carla, please uh, join me. Welcome. Hi, hi, thanks for having me. Thank you very much for being here yeah. and uh, for attending the, the whole day. So we will... Um, Okay, let me see if I can move this PowerPoint forward. <laughs> there we go. Um, so as we talk, I'll cycle through some images of your work um, and we'll just have a, quite an informal discussion, trying to bring in some of the um, salient points that were made throughout the day, but just stop me if there are works that you particularly want to discuss. Um, but just as a way to kind of introduce everyone to to your work and to your practice. Um, let's have let's talk about this work specifically at the um, Archive Museum in, in Paris, um, which is obviously a site-specific work in this incredibly ornate Rococo environment. And could you just talk a little bit about how you go about um, producing these this kind of site-specific work? Well, I guess I'd like to say that. I would sort of describe my process in, in general as just a kind of scrabbling about in the dirt or and or some kind of struggle with materials. Um, so what I would say is like, I wouldn't, we can see what the materials are here. I would never like describe how I make a work, if you know what I mean for me to try to explain how I made it is a so in in language for me is a is a kind of denigration of of the work yeah so I would like to say that I prioritize material experience above language as a way to 
move through, learn about and understand the world. And I see language as a sort of inadequate, primitive tool for communication that is too high up in the hierarchy of Western, white Western culture. Um, and I'd just like to say that I suppose we all have like physical experience of, of the world before we have anything else. We know form, we know colour. And our first sort of physical experience is of the mother's body and then we move quite quickly to the floor. And so that's how we end up there as children. But I think that um, some adults are more frequented with the floor or the ground remain more frequented with that than others. Um, and to me, I suppose like that is the world or something, like everything else is either air or built environment. And so I suppose that's where I behave. Does that help in any way to think about maybe how I make these works? So do you go and uh, in a purely practical sense, do you go and visit the site and then you just kind of allow yourself free reign once you're there in the space or, or you I mean do you kind of choose materials in advance and then go to the space or do you go to the space and then choose materials how does it what order yeah I mean I never like as you can imagine like I never start from the beginning anymore I suppose I've been working for like 20 odd years with these materials sometimes new materials come in I would have like you know, a constant practice. And so then when I have a show, I, I will I will go and visit the space. Like I have done that, but I've also um been in situations where I don't go initially for a site visit and then I just go to actually make the work. Mm -hmm. it, it probably looks I would I would think that the, the space itself probably looks like it's more important to me than it actually is that's interesting yeah and so I want to turn to this piece here going back to the beginning of your career um or near the beginning of your career 2001 um with this piece which uh is perhaps the kind of the first um moment in which you really utilize the the floor the work really situates on the floor if that's correct and um uh also when you start to really think through materials in um uh, a very interesting way so can you talk a little bit about um particularly about this work how it came about and um more generally about the kind of range of materials used and how you how you um, think through the kind of properties and nature of the materials that you use. Well, I could say you um, you could probably list the materials I use as like powders, pastes, oils, creams, and gels, and then within that, I would say. There's no hierarchy between cultural, um, natural materials. There's no hierarchy between art materials and any other materials we might find in our lives. And like this piece of work is, is just called Untitled 2000 Alka Seltzer in the Rain. And I sort of presume that everyone knows what Alka-Seltzer is, yeah? Is it sort of universal? Yeah, perhaps just give us a little... It's just like specifically in Glasgow, it's a, it's a... And I would say there's a lot of these types of materials in my work as well, like it, medicines for minor ailments, that's how I think of them. Um, Alka-Seltzer is a medicine for minor ailments, mostly sore heads, probably hangovers in this part of the world. 
Um, and so you put two, they're, they're mostly made of bicarbonate of soda with it, you know, with a pain killing element like aspirin or whatever. You put two big tablets in a glass of water and they fizz. Then you wait for the fizz to go and for it to become still again and you drink it. It puts your headache away or your hangover away, whatever. But this um, was a public art project that I actually organised myself with a friend of mine in Glasgow in 2001, just in one street. And then each day a different artist would make a piece of work, mostly outside. Sometimes inside they chose their own site. And in a way, I really sort of like came up with this whole public art project so that I can make this piece of work. So that there's somewhere for it to be that could be documented and be in a catalogue. Um, and so it's just like 2000 Alka-Seltzer tablets just dumped on the pavement and then you can rely on the rain in Glasgow and, and it came. So that was lucky. So it just all fizzes and then would eventually, it takes a while, but would just completely disappear. And how does that piece kind of, is there a through line from that piece to the work that you then started producing and continued? To produce? Yeah, I wouldn't say, I mean, that's definitely not the first time I used the ground or, or the floor, like always, always like when I was at art school, um, I was using the floor because I guess like I was, always using these sort of uh, loose raw materials that um, were uncontained, you know what I mean? That's where they're going to go. <laughs> um, but I would say that for me, like it was, we'll, we'll get more into this later and it's not, um, there's lots of sort of contradictions with, within the work and as much as things in anyone's work might appear to be choices you know often they're just compromises because really we'll we'll see as we go through um this presentation and talk about my work that possibly what's most important to me is real careful formal aesthetics so I would really always want to be making a form or a or a mark that lasts forever you know mm -hmm. and then we have these materials so why am I choosing to use these when it would seem that that's virtually impossible? And it's really just um, a compromise in terms of what is possible um, in the physical world. And at a certain point, I just decided it was more important. I want to, I use materials in a way that I can really try to sort of retard the potential the initial potential that they have within them and um, I want them to retain that life and energy and so I had to at some point decide okay what's more important it's hard for me to decide what's more important probably neither is more important but I know I have to have these materials if I'm going to have this energy in this life so I chose to continue to use them. But at a certain point when I was at art school, I would say I was first making sort of, I never um, made performance art, it was never that, but I made sort of actions with materials and for quite a few years at art school, maybe one year after I came out of my undergraduate, I couldn't work out how to remove myself from the situation, you know? I knew it wasn't about me. I don't want people to look at me or my face or my body or see that I'm a woman or any anything about me, you know. It it's about it's about the materials and the and the person look, you know, the person in the work needs to be the person looking at it. Mm -hmm. But it just took me a while to be able to work out how to remove myself. It's interesting, you know, what you're saying about this kind of this energy that pertains because there is this such a strong sense of this kind of latent energy in, in your work in a way that with that initial piece the Alka-Seltzer the untitled um thousand Alka-Seltzer that energy gets expended in a way that the it's realized the kind of potential of the materials but in your subsequent work it seems to me that that energy is really kind of always 
potential, which is really interesting and one of the kind of really powerful things about your work. Um, just to pick up on what you said about your your kind of primary interest being formal. Um, these next set of slides are um, from your recent retrospective uh, at the Des Moines Art Center uh, from 2020. And um, they just have this, it was such an interesting exhibition uh, because of the way in which your work was kind of put in dialogue with the Des Moines Art Center's incredible kind of three modernist buildings by um, Eleo Saarinen, I.M. Pei, which is what we're seeing here, and Richard Mayer, and, but then also with their collection. Um, so I'm interested in kind of the relationship of your work to this kind of high formalist aesthetic um, of both the architecture and the artworks surrounding it, um, and how you see that relationship. Well, I tell you, the absolute truth of the matter is that in terms of the IMP buildings, you just can't get those works out. So you can't get this, you can't remove the solo wet and you can't remove the Royal Liechtenstein. So that's a practical reality that, that I then have to work with. I didn't, I would put, I, I, you know, I might have chosen for them to be removed if it was at all possible. <laughs> um, and so I suppose the, I'm not saying, you know, I absolutely love that solo work. I love the Liechtenstein. I really have a, probably like a love of, of all art really, but there's no denying that that um, piece of work permission is in front of that solo work is, is iconoclastic, you know? And it's a and it's a provocation, and um, you know, and and it's like look at those shapes. Look, yeah, look at look at my shapes. <laughs> when when you look into the detail of the work, we'll see it more. That's the first time that I'd ever. I had never um, left the containers of material out before, um, like that, as part of a work. So they sit beside it there and they're really there absolutely sort of as a kind of response to those really heavy black lines of demarcation within the within the solo whip. But I suppose more importantly for me, so, and also it's interesting to talk about it in terms of like, those two big major sort of male pieces of work in the room, you know? I would say like the title of this work that I made, sorry, the previous one again, it's called Permission Is. And so I suppose, um, okay, art's different for everyone. And sometimes really what differentiates one artist's work from another is, is just, where they stop within the process, you know? So anywhere from pure gesture, performance art, all the way up to like photo realist painting, you know? It's, it's sometimes just where you stop. That's the real sort of differentiation. So for me, I would say I stop, well, this is a difficult thing to say as well, and probably something that I would contradict myself on quite quickly afterwards, mm -hmm. that I stopped quite near the beginning of the process. But in terms of like the way I, I think about art, it's like this little fenced off um, area of civilized society where some people, <laughs> or, or I could say we, are given... Um, permission to behave like the animals we are the fact that that piece of work is called permission is like in that context with those two big works as well as like yeah who who gets that permission and who gets it it's not just a permission that is given once and continues on in order to um continue to 
receive that permission to behave like that, like a creature in the material world, then we have to sort of continually make proof of that behavior that gets some um, seal of approval or through cultural judgment. And then it's like a sort of loop where uh, the permission sort of continually returns to you. Mm. So, I mean, that's what a lot of the works are made with that in mind. That one permission is specifically so, yeah. Yeah. And th this idea of, of permission um, also, I think, really resonates with this piece with the kind of smearing of Vaseline on the windows. And it, it is iconoclastic. It is, even if it's kind of affectionately. So I don't know if you can do that affectionate iconoclasm, but um, there is a kind of undermining of the austerity of these buildings, um, even while kind of reveling in the, their aesthetic, I think. Well, I, thought, I mean, it's sculpture in its initial meaning, you know, there's a sort of Latin meaning of the word that's to carve, but I think there's a much more ancient meaning in, in the work that's more Grecian that, that means to cut. And I think that, um, like, my work is trying to really 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 dig deep um into like some sort of material physical truth or like authenticity because so I would say that sculpture it's really important to me that my work is called sculpture it's not as much as it you know skirts in between mediums it gets close to installation um it skirts up against painting performance art Ultimately, it's an autonomous object. It has um, edges and it's sculpture, right? But sculpture is most interesting to me when it really within itself admits that the object is a fallacy, you know? So material is only ever flying together or flying apart and it's only our little sort of limited um, human experience of time that makes us think in any way that an object is permanent or even solid, you know, for, for very long. That's just a really sort of fleeting state in terms of like mass becomes energy becomes mass becomes energy. It's, it's just a, so I'll try to, really authentically um, work within that fleeting state. And so it's really important to me, like sculpture as, as a medium being like in the 50s and the 60s and in, so in Western culture, you know, it's the medium that sort of explodes itself into all the new forms. So we get from sculpture comes performance art, land art, sound art, video art. All those new and exciting developments come out of that medium of sculpture as a medium of sort of mass and space and time. And so while like I really want to be like in amongst all of that really exciting um, experimentation and development, as well as that, for me, like I suppose what gets lost sometimes in postmodernism um, is aesthetics, you know, and that real sort of careful, formal aesthetics that I spoke about in the beginning that's so important to me and that I think of as being part of modernism when mediums were demarcated and paintings were in frames, even abstract paintings were in frames and sculptures were on plants. And I want to try to, with my work, like pull all of that really sort of exciting experimentation and fluidity and develop right back <laughs> towards um, 
the modernist autonomous object and the edges and all the careful formal aesthetics. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think, you know, it really relates back to what we were just talking about in the final panel, panel three yeah. just now. And, you know, I, f I feel like with your work, um, firstly in asserting that it is sculpture, but then also in the way that you occupy that category, you know, you're you're always sort of breaking it open, undermining it and and exposing it as a fallacy. Um, so it's, it is really interesting that you are so kind of, um, that you really do want it to exist within that category in order exactly. to do that. It, it's still, I would still always say, okay, it's, maybe it's better that I see, you know, I like to, it's always um, almost sculpture or only just sculpture. Um, because what I'm trying to do all the time is like be on that line of really trying to elicit at least an impetus towards physical response. Mm -hmm. People who are with it, or see it, whatever. Um, yeah, so I think, and, and the same, when I'm talking about trying to be in an authentic sort of material physical space where you acknowledge um, that nothing's really solid or, or permanent. Um, I, I also deal with color in that way. And I would say like for me, like color is a material as well, mm. but it's like, I think about it the way I think about material or the object or something as well and that it, it doesn't exist you know it doesn't really exist it's a trick of the light and uh so I try to use my colors that's why they're not I don't they're not pastel colors do you know what I mean that's not the way I think of them I think of them as just getting above white and like just sort of reaching a bit of color and then stopping because I want to also draw that attention to the fact that it's sort of almost nothing, you know? Um, and that also to think that there's colors that we can't even see, like, again, there's like a really sort of limited perception of what color is and there's no color in the dark and like, we can't see at one end of the spectrum, there's ultraviolet and at the other there's infrared and we can't see those, you know? So I just want to always try to be true in some way to those physical realities, you know. Mm. I wonder. I wonder if I could um, refer back to another thing um, that was said this morning from uh, the first panel. Uh, Pepe's um, really kind of instructive dichotomy or, or transition from. The, the floor as a kind of phenomenological space to a symbolic space. Um, and to kind of put that to you, and you know, you off, you've so often work on the floor, it's, it's clearly key, and we'll talk a bit more about why that is in a minute, but um, where do you sit in that sort of, um, in, that, in that line? Where do you, what do you see the floor as operating as in your work? So, for example, you know, I sort of heard it's what you know. I don't lay a sculpture on the floor. <clears throat> you know, I don't lay something on the floor. <clears throat> so it's like that—that's where I behave, if you know what I mean. So it's much more like behavior, like it's interaction with um, it's human interaction with the material, physical world, and I suppose I think of that as being, it feels like sort of like quite animal or something like that. So I feel like when I'm scrabbling about in the dark, I don't feel like a, a woman or a necessarily even a human, do you know what I mean? You're just alive as a creature in, um, in the world interacting physically, materially mm. with it. And then, um, but that's really important to me in terms of like sculptural experience. Yes, we were talking about, okay, if I, it's been important to sort of qualify in some ways that I 
sort of think of art as an escape. So when I spoke about um, it being this little sort of category, made up, made up category, um, and it being a little fenced off area of civilization in which we're allowed to behave like the animals we are, you know, obviously that context is given, permission is given, and that's so important. Like I can do this here in that museum, wherever it was. I can't go out on the street and just drop to the ground and start doing that as much as I probably naturally would because it's um, that's not acceptable within society. And I'll be like carted off pretty quickly. So just to do with like where that happens is really important. And I think it's just really important um, to talk about because my work is like escape, it's a lot, uh, has a lot, it's not about freedom, do you know what I mean? It sort of is freedom or something. Um, and so I would want to talk about what the sculptural experience is then of that. It's like, if you think of, I feel like the experience is, a, it's a bit like a person alone in a landscape, you know? And in that, um, if you think about sort of traditional painting, say, for example, as escape, as like a window onto another world. And that's a really sort of cerebral optical escape that involves some sort of projection with your mind. Whereas sculpture like this is, you know, also an escape, but it's one that is achieved through total like absorption, engulfment, and a real sort of rooting of, of yourself, like where you are, like physically, yeah, with your feet on the floor. But that to me is, um, feels like much more of an escape mm -hmm. than what can be offered optically, if you know what I mean. Yeah, there's this, there's also this kind of interesting tension in what you're saying about, you know, art being this fenced off space where we, where you can be the animal that you are, and then the actual viewing experience in these kind of um, often, you know, very formal gallery spaces that are in some ways the kind of exact opposite and um does that you know kind of yes yeah, so that's that's really that's really I'm glad you said that and that's you know that's really important to me because if we if we want to say if if my work has a theoretical root then it's a psychoanalytic one I would say and um therefore like that really involves that's so important like that this work that I make is not interactive do you know what I mean like it's so it really like I hope you want to feel like that real edge or line of like really feel that impetus towards physical response but be stopped in that physical response by like oftentimes by like the institution itself, by the, the cultural context of where you are and you know you're not supposed to touch or, or whatever. But it's really important to me in those terms because I really think about art as, you know, as it being like a civil, as, you know, civilizing of the drives in terms of like, it's, you know, psychoanalytic roots. So I think like, therefore that, um, you know, transformation from 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 the body, from bodily visceral response must then become, has to be transformed into a cerebral one in this circumstance when you're with these sculptures in a room. And then that, what that feels like is really important to me. So how does, so you've talked uh, 
in other kind of arenas about the importance of play to your work and um, just to return to this kind of psychoanalytic <clears throat> kind of underpinning you particularly draw on or think about Melanie Klein's ideas about play and um, how it's she articulates it as a as a necessary process for the development of the ego and this interplay between interior and exterior. So um, can you talk a little bit more about that, how that um, affects your practice or informs your practice and how that also relates to this um, kind of civilizing of the drives as well? Yeah, so I don't play, if you know what I mean, I'm not playing. <laughs> and so I don't really see play as being part of my work at all we can talk about that more could just be another sort of contradiction but um yeah in terms of like the psychoanalytic root of the work it, that would be a Kleinian one rather than a Freudian one you know and Klein um as his student, as uh, the person of one of the one of the first people to, you know, work with children and babies who are pre-speech and people who are beyond speech, and to have found a way to, you know, well, yes, yeah, she created a little sort of series of wooden toys and wood look or analyze how her patients sort of interacted with those physical objects and also how they behaved in the room and therefore you know she realized that that's a communication so that's important to me because and Yeah, I think I'll stop there. But does it have a bearing on the the your use of the floor at all? I mean, yeah, I suppose like what I said at the beginning, what I think about is that we're born, you know, we have these um this physical relationship to the world and we know light and form and colour and touch and all of those things before we know what the words are for them. Um, and then our first phys physical experience of the world is really of the mother's body. And then we move quite quickly from there to the floor. So Klein, um, you know, Freud, what, you know, Freud's theories are very much based in language and he used language as the talking cure with the father as the central figure for meaning, right? And I think what Klein did, she moved on from that to say, okay, um, I will use these physical behavioral communications and she really set the mother as the central figure for meaning let's not say meaning maybe possibly more as a central figure for consequence mm -hmm. which we'll talk about later because consequences are much more interesting and important to me than meaning is um and so i would say that then when the child sort of moves from the mother's body to the floor that's where that sort of freedom begins. And you you know, you see babies and children, the first thing they do is they're playing about with some milk or whatever, and like really, really absorbed in um yeah, those sort of like movements and like images or forms, whatever they are. Um, and I would say, like, you know, we have this really strange <laughs> relationship in mainstream culture to the floor or the ground where we think. Well, like it's really far away from us. I feel like maybe some people just don't frequent it all that much as they um in adulthood, but of course, like I it's really interesting to think like most memories or and experiences, like when you're when the brain is 
at its most plastic and it, it's doing most of its uh, learning and development more than will ever happen ever again happens really really close to the ground you know so children are really close to the ground mm. babies are on the ground and then children are small and close to the ground for a really really long time and so I've got lots of memories and like flashes and things of sand and water and dirt and like all of that as like that's um my excitement to sort of first see the world or be in it or discover it it still it, it still resides there you know yeah just to can I pick up on what you you were saying about um Klein's kind of centralizing of the mother and and this kind of pre-linguistic state which is a very viscerally bod bodily state and um the your the body although absented is very present in some of the works for example in this one or this one um where you can really map the activity of your body um in making the work um and so I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on um, how the body and performativity, if not performance, what role that plays in your work. Yeah, so I don't think of it as performative and it's not performance art, you know. I, I think um, it does that thing where it's, yeah, it's only just sculpture, almost sculpture, it skips up against all these mediums. It's sometimes it's really close to painting. Or uh, you know, sort of it's you know, it gets close to performance art. It's absolutely not, because I think um what I'm trying to do is really sort of retard those materials in those states of potential. So you can and when you're in the room with it, you can see and feel um not only like the marks in it and the fact that someone's been there and done something to it which is really obvious you know which is what you're saying like you can see you can see someone's been there scrabbling around but then what you can what's more important in some well that is important but what's more important I think uh, is the how raw the material then still is so it's like it has the openness for the person who comes to look at it or be with it that they know it's wet or they know you can sense that it's wet you can sense that the powder is powder and it's not been worked up into a solid form and uh, there's the gaps in the work are really important like the gaps in the composition and things to allow people that just allows people in and with your mind like I was talking about before and those in that sort of psychoanalytic sense that so you know you could move it, you know you can change that, you know it's physically possible to just like walk in it or like shuffle it around. But the fact and the fact that um for me, like that when that happens and then you know that that sort of physical response is possible and you don't do it, but then it it sort of um transfers to your mind. Like I feel it's a really hard thing to talk about in language, I think, but I feel that there's an agility of mind. Mm -hmm. And so, and that that is it, that's communicated. I, it, it's like without words, you know what I know, what you, you know, and that that agility of mind and the open, and the possibility and the energy and the life and all that is um communicated I think mm. it's really important for me to say that um you know the work is abstract the abstraction is really really important but it's not just um pictorially abstract in that um of course it is but 
you know, it doesn't work itself up into a picture or a rep representation or any figuration. Um, but it's also materially abstract, which to me means that it doesn't work itself up into like structure or permanence or solidity and that sort of material abstraction is is a really important sort of communication for me and we can get into that a bit later if you want and how I feel you know that for me that's a real sort of political stance. Mm, yeah that would be really interesting for the discussion. Um, I probably need to move to the discussion fairly quickly I mean the Q&A but um, just one last question um, and then I'll sure more will come to me in the in the q a um but um meaning you've talked about yep. kind of meaning you have quite an ambiguous stance to this idea of meaning and um you have resisted lots of kind of critical uh, analysis that's tried to impose certain meanings on your work um and you certainly kind of push against any prescribed meaning or categorization um but there's also the suggestive meaning you know suggestive meanings are are everywhere and so i i wonder if you could talk a bit more about how your work complicates this ideas of meaning and signification and also consequence which you talked about and especially thinking about your titles which um have this kind of almost like fragments of poetry that suggest meaning without ever allowing it to kind of take form. Okay, right, so we, can I just say that, um, it's good because in some ways it ties right back to the very beginning when we, when I said that um, I prioritize material experience above language as a way to move through, learn about, understand the world and communicate probably. Um, so I, we can, maybe get into this more in the discussion I don't know I have a lot lots and lots of trouble with that word meaning well I don't know what it means okay for one the other thing is that my work it does not point outside of itself through symbolism narrative metaphor you know to meaning it just doesn't do that all that it is is contained within it and that and that's why I guess it's abstraction both pictorially and materially is really important so I would say that I like to think really about sort of concrete physical reality and in that sense consequence is much more important to me than meaning and so we can talk about that in terms of what I think the consequences of my of what I do and, and my work are but also like in general maybe I could sort of explain it a little bit even sometimes I think about okay what means the most to people or whatever in language maybe it's love or something you know and that's something that um we deal with in our language uh, a lot in in poetry and and prose via sort of symbolism and metaphor and narrative right but I suppose the way I think about it is okay it, especially you know if <laughs> love has no practical application um then it doesn't exist you know what I mean so something like love only exists at all like in the world through its practical application that then leads to consequence you know it doesn't matter what's said or written or especially in terms of babies and children you know it's the practical application that is gonna that has some sort of effect um in the world so but I would say, and then sometimes I, I also wrote down recently that I feel like sort of meaning is like a kind of, if you know, I feel like 
if my work is freedom or something like that, I feel like meaning is a, like a substitute for freedom and it's for when we must suffer, you know? So I think in terms of my work, like the consequences of what I'm trying to do is like, I think that, you know, people think that they want art, institutions, galleries, the market, think they want art but I think they don't really you know it's a really difficult messy chaotic business and I <laughs> I'm trying to really um make sure that that human behavior and the result of it continue to exist and I, I hope that the real consequences, physical consequences of my work and me doing that are that this really difficult, messy, chaotic business of what art really is, is just getting rammed into the gallery, the institutions, the market, the culture, the civilised culture. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think about as like real practical, physical consequences. And I don't um care about about meaning as it relates to language i think that is an ideal place to um turn to the q a um and there are a few questions so uh, this is um an interesting one from Nancy Ann Miller. Do you work against the notion of permanence in your work? No. So I guess like this, it's, so this is one of the things about my work that's a real contradiction, okay? My works are absolutely permanent and I'm obsessed by that because I'm really obsessed by the um, careful formal aesthetic of it when it's finished I want it to last forever it's just that um, but it's also really interesting to me that sort of 500 years um, bar <laughs> that galleries and museums and, and institutions give to things um, but when my work is finished it's entirely permanent and that's a pro provocation as well and a sort of contradiction but it exists in um, museums and, you know, the powder floor works. It's just there, there, there are ways, you know, and there's lots of different categories to the work, but something like a powder floor work can be, you know, there's all different, there's a whole sort of range of works, some that I have to put out myself, some that other people, you know, once it's finished and that can then be, photographed and diagrams made of it and um it's almost like a sort of recipe for a cake or whatever that can then be recreated in the museum that has all the materials and maybe there's parts of it that are more permanent that remain but no permanence is really important to me so the fact that I use these materials is ridiculous but it's not it's just a really difficult choice and it's a compromise mm. So we've got another uh, comment uh, from Sam Latter. I feel your work gives a feeling that when you encounter them, they've been left behind as if we arrived late to something or we've walked in on something that's still being created. Moments we've encountered unexpectedly, almost projected or enhanced domesticated moments. Not really a question because there's a feeling of authentic actions left behind by someone. And should we be there at all as a viewer, but do we stay and look? I mean, that's really nice. And uh, thank you for that. And it makes me think I would hope what I'm really trying to achieve all the time is like, which is obviously completely impossible, but what nature can do. So it's like, although of course we are natural, you know, I don't see us as separate from nature. I don't see my work as separate from nature but I would like to think like they've said there that it's almost like a person alone in a landscape and when you're out and you come upon a tree or a river or a patch of a 
field or whatever you know what's the difference if my work is good or you know if a work of, of mine is good it should be like that mm -hmm. can I ask you to pick up on um this use of the word domesticated which I know is one that you uh resist in quite a um forceful way and the reason you resist it, if I'm right, is that you, you um, kind of resist these um, interpretations or analyses of your work through any kind of lens of the, the feminine or the domestic, um, but you do see your work as feminist, if I'm not mistaken. And I wonder if you could just um, articulate a bit for us what your distinction between those two are is and how you kind of view your work as a feminist statement yeah and I'd like to say I don't object at all to what that person said you know about no 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 I was just picking up on that like um really nice about yeah just like someone doing something like that someone then um happens to see after they've walked away or whatever but um yeah it's I mean how this is gonna be long you know <laughs> This is like oh, okay. four minutes. <laughs> right. Well, I don't know where to begin. Um oh, okay. <laughs> no one know, you know, okay, like when I was at art school and I was making work and we had crits, I would always just have people, the comments would be your work so domestic, it's so feminine. I was like using apples and stuff and like bread dough and whatever. And um I would just be um would be really offended by that. And I, I just feel like um things are said about women's work that aren't said about men's work. Often people say about my work now, oh, it's really feminine and there's all this sort of pink and these light colours and like um floaty and permanent, fragile, all those words that offend me no end, you know, because no one would say to Franz West, who made loads of pink work, oh, is your, is your work pink because it's feminine or Richard Tuttle and his fragility and the small scale is your, your work's really fragile. That's, you know, it's so feminine. And also... Like my work is massive, it you know it it takes it's heavy, it, it takes a lot of physical endurance to make it. That's what I see. And if you want to say it's feminine, then use those words which are feminine to me, strong, um, physically capable, you know, full of endurance, like all all that. But that is not said as we know the cultural judgment that comes at you from outside. You know, I was shocked by those things being said to me at art school because I thought, you know, you don't know, at least my experience is you sort of don't really know you're a girl or whatever until someone points it out to you. And the cultural judgment comes at you from the outside. And I suppose when that coach I felt like that cultural judgment was being made of me, I came to probably recognize my own sort of misogyny as well to think well why am I why is that bad why am I bothered and I was bothered because it it felt like people were sort of saying that the work was secondary or not important and I don't know really if that's how I felt about it because of my own unconscious misogyny at that time or if that I expect it's also that was there like in that cultural judgment and so at that time I sort of felt like okay if this is all that people can see in the work is this what do I do do I start to like use metal wood bronze primary colors whatever and I just thought I just made a decision at that time just coming out of art school to continue to do it to use the materials that I wanted to that I loved and to really um engage with that cultural judgment and give the question back you know and really point it out um but it's important to say that my work is feminist that I, that I see abstraction as really political you know as a political stance and I think it's a shame 
in a lot of our Western culture that's not really seen like that and that sort of narrative things that are work that's narrative or more language based or symbolic or whatever is seen as political when really um pictorial and material abstraction is a provocation and a resistance and especially a feminist one because you know there's no figure there's no face and I have pieces of work that are called forget about faces and it's just that whole thing about that I tried to do with my work about being so like absorbed in the world so engulfed by it so connected to your own sort of physical material experience that you have no thought of what you look like or you know what's that someone might be looking at you or what and I think that um I know myself what that feels like when you are absorbed the, the minute you do have to think about those things it does also involve language but really the sort of pictorial figurative you know, really breaks the spell. Mm. I think of that that is connection to the world. Yeah, I think that is um really important and a and a brilliant place to leave off this idea of um this like, abstraction and this kind of pre linguistic state of as being an act of resistance. Um, you know, um, against this kind of um patriarchal system um so thank you very much Carla it's been a real thank pleasure you. speaking to you and um thank you to all the panelists um from earlier today and a special thanks to uh Jen Ongley and to Gemma in the research department here for organizing such a fantastic symposium um so with that I'll say goodbye thank you everyone thanks thank Carla. you bye bye